Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Product in LA podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Cole, and this is an opportunity to shine the spotlight on some of the exceptional technology leaders we have as part of the LA community. Super excited to chat with Riza Razul today. Thank you for joining us, Riza. Hey, Ethan. It's always good to uh, to chat with um, uh, former colleagues. Thanks so much for reconnecting. Yes. No, we uh, worked together on a startup briefly a few years back. I'm really excited to reconnect and I'm very excited to share your story. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsors. Product in LA is brought to you by Yeruit, available at yeruit.com, U-R-U-I-T.com. Do you need help completing your roadmap items? Yeruit is a digital product development agency with over 15 years of experience helping US-based companies build web and mobile apps by embedding directly into their scrum teams. Yeruit's expert full-stack software developers provide quality code to help you get the job done. If you need React or Angular front-end devs, or perhaps help with Node.js, .NET, or Python development, DevOps, or even product or design to help solidify requirements, they're ready to help you close out features and actually release updates to customers. Learn more at uruit.com. That's U-R-U-I-T.com. We're also brought to you by the Product Managers Association Los Angeles, available at pma.la. They are the largest professional organization for product and designers in LA. With more than 3,000 members from over 500 companies, they host monthly meetups, organize the Product Leader Council, where CPOs and heads of product connect in small six to eight member pods, and have a mentorship program where they connect working product managers with students from underrepresented groups to help build a better, more diverse next gen. To learn more about PMA, go to pma.la. To learn more about the mentorship program, go to pmala.la slash mentorship. Our guest today is Riza Rasul. He is the CTO of Real Networks and in past roles, he's been the founder at Kwai Oak. He was the CTO at Zaya and the chief engineer and VP of product at Widevine Technologies. And one interesting fact you might find from his LinkedIn page, there's actually two of them. I, I, there are too, too, good, uh, too many goodies in there. Uh, he's worked for two companies that were acquired by Google and he is also the owner of the trademark for CTO as a service. Is that, is that correct? Is is that so? Did I trademark it? I don't recall. It seemed like a good tagline. <laughs> I'm not sure if I got to the point of trademarking it, but um, if if I did and forgot about it, maybe I should go and see if there's any value in it. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you have the TM on it, so I think it. I, 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 think, I think you I probably went through it. it. it trademark, yeah, but it's not a registered. A registered copyright, but you can you can put TM on things when you, I think when you start using it, um, and I think I, maybe I, I was the first to start doing that. Yeah, I don't know. Do I just unleash some patent lawyers out there? Going to go steal it right now? Oh gosh, let's not. <laughs> let's not say we did. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, I would love to. There's so many gems in your background, but I'd, I'd really love to start from the beginning, you know, the technology you're playing around with today at, at Real Networks. And it's, it's for those of you who haven't, you know, kept up with it, you know, it started in, in the nineties. If you were listening to me, sorry, in the, in the early two thousands, late nineties, if you're listening to something on the internet, it was likely through Real Networks and you're doing just absolutely amazing things in AI right now. You've kind of pivoted from being a streaming media player to helping folks enter and do some other security stuff, enter buildings and enter do other security stuff with AI-based technologies. Um, but none of these things existed when when you were growing up. So uh, love to hear about your journey in technology. Was this a path you, you thought you'd end up in or how'd you find yourself uh, in the CTO chair? Um, well, it wasn't a path that my, my parents wanted me to follow. Okay. Um, um my mom wanted me to be a doctor uh, <laughs> i went through the whole process i was a, a stem student through high school and uh dutifully applied to uh, medical schools in in the uk that's where i was uh, that's where i grew up right. um and i got to the final round of interviews at king's college hospital a mahogany lined boardroom with all the consultants and uh, the final panel and they said, well, Mr. Russell, 
Now for the final question, tell us why is it you want to become a doctor? Oh no. <laughs> and I paused for a bit too long there. It was like rain, <laughs> dead, dead air on the radio, which you don't want. Um, and they could see the wheels turning in my head. And then I confessed to them. I said, well, you know, actually I can't stand sick people. Oh. And their heads all looked down <laughs> at their feet. And uh, I think that was that was apparently a disqualifier for <laughs> for a young um, aspiring um, medical student. So anyway, um, uh, they said, "Well, perhaps you might want to consider something else." So I ended up studying physics at King's College, wow. and uh, I enjoyed that. In fact, um, I'll be heading back to the UK in uh, um, a couple of weeks. Um, in uh for, for the 40th reunion of of the college so that, that tells you how old i am um but um what started me you were mentioning that real networks you know the the the, the company that actually um invented streaming media this thing that we're doing now we're you know over video conferencing and and audio streaming and video streaming that was invented by real networks a long time ago when when it was difficult to do when the yeah. way we connected to the internet was you well you recall maybe maybe you're too young Ethan to remember the sound of dialing up to the to the internet oh no i i, I remember that <laughs> nice i remember it very well yeah the, the dial up I mean, internet and it's and it's still the phone line too yes exactly you use the phone line when the, when you need to use the internet so so at that time, what was I doing? Well, I wasn't part of Real Networks at that time. Um, I was in the UK and I'd fallen in with a bunch of um, similar, similarly minded engineers. And we thought we'd like to figure out a way to edit a movie on a computer. OK. At that time, movies were edited by splicing film or by recording uh, the the film onto videotape and have multiple copies of them and you'd have multiple machines and you'd have an edit controller you'd press play on one deck and record on the other mm. and after a laborious mechanistic um process you would get a story ends up as a a piece of it becomes a movie that's that's viewable Right. And it was incredibly time consuming at that time. So we thought, well, how hard could it be? We, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd record um, the video um, uh, as files on a computer. We'd create a graphical user interface um, uh, and we would, you know, allow someone at a, at a computer to be able to edit a movie. And so that product was called Lightworks. Okay. And it was the first... In those days, it was called a non-linear editor. It was the first of a generation of movie editors that would allow you to edit a full-length feature film on a computer. Wow. And those that, that product won a technical Oscar and a technical Emmy Award, and it was on the strength of that success that I moved from London to the place where movies are made here in, in Hollywood. So I don't know if that's the most LA thing I've done. I came to Los Angeles and it turns out that what I what I built with this group that I guess we'd now look back and call a startup. Um, right. what, what I built was something that transformed and disrupted um, Hollywood. And um I guess as we we talk about AI today, I, I think I'm seeing I'm I'm feeling echoes, hearing echoes of that type of disruption in what we're doing. So that that's that's the, I guess the story of how I came from there to here. But I started somewhere in the middle of the story. It actually goes back earlier on, and we can we can cover that as we chat. Well, I, I'd have to go back to I, I'm not sure it's the most LA thing because I think the most LA thing is to go to Hollywood for an Oscar. It's, <laughs> you've already got one and then you move there. I, I, yeah, I don't that's know. right. It's, it's uh, something the, different. Yeah, the technical Oscar, technical, you know, in 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 those technical Oscars, you they they don't even they don't even show them on the on the the televised um, award ceremonies. They 
they might refer to it or they might have a little you know a little recap of here's what what uh, happened earlier on in the week but it's the products that actually win the the award so um you get you know a product and and this product won both technical oscar technical emmy award the mm-hmm. the company lightworks actually went through multiple um changes of ownership in fact it 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 got acquired by Tektronics, which was the big sort of oscilloscope TV equipment manufacturer. Um, They coupled it with a series of digital disc recorders. I don't know if you recall the Tektronics profile. Um, Ultimately, it went through multiple changes of ownership, but now Lightworks is an independent company uh, and still producing this editing system that's still uh, that editors are still using to cut uh, movies on. Um, so um, uh, Thelma uh, Schumacher um, is a renowned editor. She edits all of Martin Scorsese's movies and they use Lightworks. So um, the uh, um, the Irishman, you know, that movie that maybe could have used a bit more editing. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was three hours long. Right. Uh, that that was the most recent one in my memory that that was cut on on Lightworks. So as well as the product winning technical Oscar Tech, technical Emmy awards, the 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 products that came out of it, the the work product, um, those also there's a string of hundreds of Oscar winning uh, movies that were edited on Lightworks. So okay, so there's a story. <laughs> That's terrific, and and I guess just want to. Double click back, maybe a step further back. Uh, so you're in the room with the mahogany tables, and they're asking if you want to be a doctor. And what was your thought there at all? Hey, I want to get into digital technology or movie making technology, or was it really at that point you were still too young to, and you didn't really know where you're going to head yet? And then it was a, you know, it was life kind took of, you this way. Yeah, it was a kind of a big reset in my head about what is it you want to do. And in those pre-internet days you didn't really have a lot of time. Um, Universities didn't have a lot of time to fill the empty seats in their, um, in their, in their uh, degree courses that weren't filled and candidates that are not that, because you were only in those days allowed to apply to five colleges. There was a standardized sort of university application form. You could only apply to five. And if you, if you, um, score got got nothing then you've got your credentials you've got your high school diploma and 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 your grades and so on uh but you had no place to go to and so there was a there was a period called clearance it was a mad scramble of, of maybe less than two weeks where um buyers had to find sellers you know they they had to they had to go match up and it it was right. done just purely by either by visiting the college or or getting on the phone and and, and calling so I did that. Um, fortunately, I lived in London, uh, just outside London. Um, and so getting in on the train and I went to visit all the colleges around uh, London and then ended up accidentally getting into uh, a physics uh, degree. I went in, I guess I went into to do my, my, my favorite subject was chemistry. So I went to the chemistry mm. department and they said, no, come back after lunch. And as the elevator descended to, to the ground floor, it opened up on the the first floor in 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 the in the UK. The first floor is the floor above the ground floor. Um, and I looked right. up. I saw a physics department. Hmm. Okay. Went in there and chatted with someone and um, told them a story about myself and and how I've always wanted to do physics and <laughs> ended up <laughs> on a degree course for physics. So so that was. So that was it. I guess I've, I've got this uh, streak in me of um, not knowing what uh, I can't do. Um, and <laughs> anyway, no, that's so, fantastic. Not knowing what you can't do. I mean, that's mm-hmm. or another put another way, not limiting yourself, not not saying, "Hey, I can't do that," or only you know setting a path and then forcing yourself to set to keep to that path because that's what you think you can handle. Um, and I, I imagine that's helped you in your career to do things that hadn't been done before or, or, you know, and break new ground. So, um, 
So maybe let's go back to, to real networks where you're now CTO. Um, and I think what, how is that, has that helped in your path there? Has there been anything so that's transformed? I, yeah. How did I get there? First of all, um, well, you recall when, when you and I worked together, I was running this CTO as a service consulting practice. Right. Um, that was after a, a string of, uh, startup um, experiences many exits as you as you said two exits to google that's right lots of wealth created along the way jobs created and lots of um, successes in getting startups funded um, because i could go in front of a group of vcs and tell a story and come away with a check or with a term sheet or something like that um, so i felt i was pretty hot. <laughs> and so this <laughs> consulting practice, um, uh, CTO as a service, was my formula for trying to scale up the thing that I thought I was good at. Mm. Um, and the, the, the model was um, place a CTO into a company, um, uh, bring along a, um, a team of software developers, much like your sponsors are doing, but also bring along funding as well. Mm. And that funding either came by introductions to VCs or by um, debt financing of uh, of the development. So what does that, that meant? You had to be more successful than the one in 10 uh, rate of, um, of that the VCs experience in the debt financing part. And it's very easy <laughs> to, to make a gamble and, and lose. Right. And so um, uh, we had a good run for a while. And uh, eventually when things got lean, um, a call came in from a recruiter saying, hey, Real Networks is looking for a CTO. And um, gosh, who'd, who'd have thought that seven years later, I'm still um, in, in the position. But, but the thing that attracted to me attracted me to to, to the opportunity um, and why I gave up my own consulting practice and, and startup was I told myself a story. And the story was, and I often do this, you, you try and project forward what would success look like. So um, here is a journey that we're going to go on, a mission. Um, what is the mission? Well, the mission is to turn around this beloved brand. Everyone remembers real. They they can actually, I think it's one of the most recognizable logos that yep. sort of. Um, I can I can picture it right now. Yeah, right, exactly. With the R in it. They remember that. Wouldn't it be great to be associated with the team that helped turn around that brand? And um, so I. I, I projected what success would look like. Maybe it was in a class reunion and you're introducing yourself. What are you doing now? What have you done? Oh, you're part of that team that turned around Real Networks. Um, so so that was the story I told myself. And um, I, I threw, threw my hat into the ring. No, I, I threw myself completely into the job. And um, the, the, the turnaround of Real Networks we didn't know how we were going to do it at the time, but the, the owner and CEO, Rob Glazer, had just returned back to the company from a period away. And the company was um, bleeding cash, had no direction. It was a collection of disparate businesses that somehow, you know, as, <laughs> as, as we were falling out of the plane, we had to kind of stitch together a parachute and then maybe even construct some wings so we can fly and gain gain altitude again. And that's and that's basically the task. And so it's a pretty, pretty daunting task. But I think we're more than halfway through that turnaround. Um, so it's not it's no longer late breaking news unless unless news comes to you by by carrier pigeon, I suppose. But at the beginning of the year, Real Networks start. It's what well, we started the year as a private company, and so Rob right. Glazer bought up all of the common stock, and 
um, took the company private. Why are we doing that? Because Wall Street didn't know how to score a company that was using um, its legacy business, the profits from its legacy business, plus all of its treasure, mm -hmm. um, all of its you know, bank balance, in order to fund um, growth initiatives. And that's what we were doing. We were kind of running a deficit um, in order to, to invest. And so Wall Street just looks at your overall p and and says, wow, okay, you're just you're just um, lost. And so uh, taking the company private was, I guess, Rob's biggest um, investment he'd made in his career. And right. it, 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 but it shows uh, a faith and uh, an endorsement, personal endorsement for the technical and the commercial direction that we take. And I'd love to tell you more about what we're doing there in AI. Um. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that would, I think that's something that our listeners would be interested in. So, you know, how do you, how do you take a company where you're known for one thing and, and, you know, especially this one where you're known, it's almost like a child star, right? Like a child actor, you, you got, you made your big break real early in your career. And then, you know, at middle age, what do you, what are you looking to do? Uh, it broke through early on in career as the, as the streaming service. And I believe it was video towards the end. It was certainly audio. And I feel like it was almost everything that, um, it was almost everything in between, but, um, right now it's going towards the, a whole different direction. And, and I guess I'm not sure how much you're allowed to speak to it, but I'd love to hear any bits and pieces that, that you're able to actually kind of related um let's see let's let's weave a story and uh show how they're related um so we were we we had a sort of engineering dna in the company for processing video this was either um compressing it um okay. streaming it across the internet um so a continuation of that um, processing would be to identify what is inside the video, what objects are in the video, and who's in the video. Okay. And we so we applied AI to that. Well, first, first of all, you know, when I arrived, I did an inventory of all of all of the technical assets we had to try yeah. and figure out, okay, how are we going to power this turnaround, at least from a CTO's point of view? How are we going to power it technically? I realized we had no AI, zero. So it wow. wasn't a, it wasn't a, a difficult um, guess to say, well, let's just go and inject some AI into all of our product streams and see what takes root. So in the, in the analysis of video, um, we thought it would be uh, an interesting challenge to see if we can identify people in video if if you can recognize a face and we set up a little skunk works inside one of our development teams and before we knew it our metrics were starting to get better and better we were mm -hmm. outperforming the um the publicly available um algorithms the one um by amazon we 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 uh outperformed them technically, a Microsoft one. Um, and uh, we submitted our algorithm to NIST um, that runs a, an annual bake-off. I think twice a year they they uh, do a bake-off of all of the facial recognition algorithms. And we started climbing up the ranking. That's great. Well, the interesting thing um, that NIST also scores on was the the size of the algorithm and the speed of the algorithm. And uh, when Rob, when, when we when we revealed the program to Rob um, and we showed him, okay, here's where we've got areas of differentiation. He said, look, I'm not interested in being another me too in the cloud SaaS video analytics platform. Um, right. We need to be the world's best for live video. Hmm. So what does that mean for live video? 
Well, it's difficult to do process live video. It's really uneconomical to process it um, if it's streamed over the internet. To, to to and 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 you want to be able to deal with this in at real time in real time. So right. the fact that our algorithms are the fastest meant that we we were able to we had a shot of being able to keep up with real time video that's coming at you thirty frames a second. And the the very DNA that we had the engineering DNA that that you know a pioneered video compression and audio compression and streaming when it was difficult to do it across the internet, that same DNA and technical chops uh, was in this team. And that gave us the codec that was actually the small um, codec, I said it, the AI model that was actually the smallest compared to the rest of the industry. So that meant we can not only keep up with live video, but we could actually embed the algorithm into an IoT device, into a smart camera or wow. a um a door reader or something like that so then we midway through the program we decided to pivot towards the edge take the uh, take the um the algorithm down from the clouds you know it was all uh, it was program we had to re basically reprogram the entire stack in c c plus mm plus -hmm. and and double down on our our core strengths which is our the size of the algorithm and speed we yeah. already were you know, meeting accuracy benchmarks. And um, anyway, so so we end up with the world's best face analytics stack for live video, bar none. And um, we then, now, now you face the other challenges, which a pr product manager probably um, has to wrestle with, is the, the what are the headwinds that your product is going to face right. in terms of acceptance um, by the industry, by society, and so on. And of course, if you say, "Well, we've got facial recognition technology," yeah, it, it's a it's a real hot button item. And uh, you know, at the same time, people are opening their phones with their face. But then, Riz is holding up his iPhone, so you could, as if the you're opening your iPhone with the face recognition ID or the exactly uh, it's face recognition. But the very difference there's a difference between the use case, the use case of opening your phone, and the use case of walking through the shopping mall and being spied on by surveillance cameras without your permission. Right. So once we. <clears throat> Once we decided as a business to focus on the opt-in use case, those those sort of societal headwinds and the the friction that we were um, uh, we were coming up against um, seemed to go away. And so we hmm. we we steered the technology towards products towards use cases where the consumer opts in, where they're using biometric authentication as a convenience and it's and it's you make it optional you say well you can still badge in if you want to but on the days that you've forgotten your badge down your face is your badge right and so we we basically took that face recognition stack and we implemented it in a module that replaces your badge reader so you can unplug unhook the badge reader and plug in this this module now oh. your face is your badge and that is that 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 product is powering one of our AI divisions, and I think it's going to be um, super successful. Yeah, is I like the there's one piece you mentioned where it's the it's the recognition for the benefit of the customer. I'm, I'm butchering exactly. the way you described it, but it's the opt in, and so yeah, there's certainly facial recognition challenges that we've heard about a lot of with surveillance but at the same time most folks won't think about the day-to-day -day facial recognition that is beneficial and helpful for them the phone being the most clear most yeah. clear example of that from having to have an unlocked phone that was more dangerous than ever now with everything on with everything inside your phone and right. most people not you know logging out every time they they leave an app uh the ability to just pick it up and point at your face and have it open up is is incredible um do you see what do you see the future of it especially as as a person who's 
in the opt-in facial recognition world, I know, I know you can't go too deep into anything, you know, that you guys are working on, but from like a 10,000 foot view consumer or, you know, vital yeah. perspective, what, where do you see opt-in technologies really coming together with, with facial recognition or, or AI oh, generated or AI aided biometrics? Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned one of the key words, FIDO. Um, so people should start reading up and getting and get acquainting themselves with FIDO. I think FIDO solves one of the biggest consumer points of pain um, that 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 are still lingering around in the user experience. Um, so to, just just a quick um, uh, pricey of what FIDO is. Um, it's it's an organization that's trying to take us uh, trying to kill the password but basically make the password passe um it, when the internet was formed um businesses were trusted entities on the internet why were they trusted because they went through the hurdle of getting themselves um uh, a certificate a digital certificate and that digital certificate um uh required you to you know show your your uh, corporate identity your maybe a dun and brad street number your proof of 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 residence of of of, of an address and so on and yeah. once you had that you went through that hurdle once and a corporation a, you know a, a dot com domain or a, any domain has a digital certificate and now can communicate um with uh, uh, https uh, protocol and it's a trusted entity. Right. Um, when consumers log on to the internet, um, when they when they connect, they are untrusted, and they have to um, authenticate every single time. So the default position is they treat it as a criminal or an unknown person and have to prove their identity every single time. Right. That that asymmetry is probably. It, it, well, if 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 we just look at the the asymmetry is a big point of friction, but the way that it was solved, um, I think I'm not sure who is responsible for it, but it's there's one engineer said, so well, okay, temporarily we're just going to use this the username and the password. So a password will be a secret that the the user creates, and the username will be the the publicly known, and uh, we can we can. Um, uh, businesses can use that to to re cross reference and make sure it's the same person, but the password will be a secret. Well, in order to authenticate, you have to share that secret, and and if the secret's shareable, then it might get shared not just with the relying party with the business that you're trying to communicate with. It might be shared widely, and so this is the cause of maybe eighty seven percent of cyber breaches is the attack on the password. Right. And so it's a security vulnerability. FIDO um, also um, addresses the, the not only the security vulnerability, but, but, but kind of the friction, the user friction. Um, there's also some uh, huge number of uh, the, w where the, the sort of shopping cart abandonment rate that results from people that are about to purchase something they get presented with the authentication dialogue where and they've forgotten their password or they've forgotten their username. And that point of friction results in billions of lost revenue. Right. So there's a dollar amount, a real sort of e-commerce dollar amount and then there's the vulnerability, the liability that the password has caused and the result, the resulting sort of cyber uh, breaches. So you can tell I'm not a fan <laughs> of passwords. <laughs> and so how does um, how does what I'm doing uh, and what we're doing at Real Networks help? Well, um, so, so the FIDO organization has come up with uh, a standard, and at the end of last year, Apple, Google, Microsoft all came on board. They took the standard, and the, these three, you know, big consumer brands 
pulled together and said, okay, we're going to create an operating system implementation that's going to be common amongst Apple, Google, and Microsoft, and they call it Pass Keys. So okay. Pass Keys is the implementation of FIDO. At the moment, it's it's good for logging into a website, but the uh, the relying party needs to have a FIDO server. Anyway, the experience is very delicious. You uh, go to log in at a, um, onto, onto your page, providing it's got the FIDO JavaScript in that page. Right. Instead of having to type in your credentials, the, uh, the login page scans surrounding Bluetooth devices to see if, you've, if you have the credentials on there. And it's a Bluetooth handshake and, and you're logged in. Wow. Okay, so that was the, the, the initial FIDO protocol. Let's say you don't have an account yet. Um, you, you create the account and it asks you, well, do you want to do it with old username and password or do you have an authenticator, a FIDO authenticator? You select, I have a FIDO authenticator. It searches, it says, I've found two or three FIDO authenticators. Which one do you want to use? And so um, you use you use that. Now, in some cases, um, and, and what we 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 are offering is the a face biometric on it. So you're not only authenticating against this device, but you're if you need to authenticate that Riza is actually in possession of his device, then we offer that where yeah. you're looking at it. Now you say, well, okay, you can do that with face ID. Right. That is a self um a self-asserted identity. This isn't a, a certified identity that this is really me and it's the same me that's on my driver's license or on my my government document. So if you need a strong authentication and you want it to be super convenient, you use a biometric authenticator. So your question of where is this going? I think ultimately, at the moment, we're using it um, safer biometric authentication. The the, the product's called Safer. Um, the 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 safer scan devices for opening doors, but right. ultimately, that same core of technology is going to help you open virtual doors. So log into the network. So it's not only for physical access, but it's for logical access as well. So you become like your own two-factor authentication. Exactly. So send you a text, so, you just kind of put your face up there and the first one yeah. would be a, a handshake between Bluetooth devices and then the facial right. recognition is if for the very important your things. Your face that you want could to be your username. Mm. Your face is your sort of publicly facing username. <laughs> there's still, you know, you, you, there's still going to be another factor of authentication to uh, th th that gets communicated by your phone, and that might be a um, uh, a token that that was deposited on your phone uh, by the, the the relying party or some other mechanism. But it's using tried and trusted PKI infrastructure. So there's a public and private key pair. The private key the consumer holds. The public key is the, the, the what the relying party holds and the relying party then challenges you by encrypting some challenge with the public key that can only be decrypted by the private key okay <laughs> that's so, awesome so, so that was that that's where fido um uh came in um with pass keys apple google microsoft said mm, we really want the private key to be um communicated across all um, the consumer's devices because they are very used to being able to create an account on one device, but that their other devices know how to log in as well. You, you've, you're familiar with doing that, you know, your Chrome browser um, magically on a, on a device you've never used um, knows your usernames and passwords if, you, if you've logged in. Right. Uh, okay, so um, that that kind of breaks the purity of PKI, but uh, Fido for for the, for for the endorsement of of Microsoft, Google, and and Apple um, 
acceded to that that modification, and so um, the the private key is is sort of shareable between your devices. Um, I, I guess there is a flag where you can say no, the um, the private key can only be bound to a single device, and that will be for the rare cases where you need super strong authentication and you don't want a token that is, you know, can be replicated multiple times. Okay, so I've I've answered that with more detail than you probably needed. <laughs> no, no, that's terrific. I mean, okay. I mean, there's so many gems that came out of it. I think another one of my favorites is this concept that your face is your username, which which definitely makes sense, but uh, I've, I'd never put that together, uh, quite like that before I, that, that, that's, that's yeah. an exciting, uh, that's, that's an exciting place that we're headed soon. So, yeah, I um, mean, yeah. Is, isn't that how we recognize people as, as humans, you know, yeah. this is your username, um, it's your handle and, uh, yeah, I, okay. So you might want to go downtown. You might want to go downtown with the balaclava on. People are going to look at you oddly, okay, but it's your choice, I guess. <laughs> you might want to go incognito, sunglasses, and you know. that's right. <laughs> Maybe that's the very LA, yeah, no. you know, the hoodie and the, sun, the baseball cap and, and sunglasses, and dark glasses, because hey, I'm I'm a celebrity. I don't want to be I don't want to be recognized. It's my day off. That's awesome. That incognito mode, the LA style. Right. That's terrific. Um. And to to ground it, is there is there uh, we've talked about winning an Oscar with the with the company you're at. That's that's a very LA thing. Is there is there anything else that comes to mind? The uh, the most LA thing, but I mean we could we could leave it at winning an Emmy and an Oscar. That that uh, that is above and beyond. That's a very LA thing. And 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 uh, it's it, it's uh, well it, it's it's interesting that. Um, some when we when we were building when we were building the Lightworks product, we had um, small snippets of of movie material to mm. test it on, and uh, at that time, the the software was in an early beta, and in Hollywood, a movie was being edited, and we couldn't figure out what the the movie was. Um, we couldn't tell what the plot line was. We recognize some of the actors um, in in the clips of movies, um, and so we got the the rushes, which R rushes is the UK version of what in Hollywood's called dailies. The dailies, yeah. So as the movie was being edited, um, we would get FedEx to us. Um, yeah, daily. We 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 get the dailies. That's why. So dailies makes a lot more sense. So daily, <laughs> we get the dailies, and we were trying to figure out okay, what's this story all about. And I needed to know what the story was because part of what I was doing, um, I I had written. My focus was on the digital audio, the DSP code for the the audio part of 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 Lightworks. Okay. But I'd also in early on, I'd written. Um, the edit decision list code, the EDL code that would take the internal sort of timeline of of how the, all the material is chopped up and right. translate that to the machines that would cut the film. So, um, and, and so I created this EDL um, uh, um, translator, and um, well, it. Turned out, um, it turned out that the movie, I, I got to see the movie many years later in its final form. Um, and the movie was pulp fiction. Oh, and, really? Yeah. So so I was I was watching it in a drive-in. Now, this is many years later. I moved my family. We 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 owned a station wagon and we wanted to have the whole American experience. And in LA, there was one of the last movie drive-in theaters on Winnetka in in the San Fernando Valley nice and I'm watching Pulp Fiction and there's a towards the end of the movie the scenes are all out of order like hold on <laughs> at this point of the movie oh no John Travolta is dead at this point of the movie why why is he there and I I I, I think that it could have been a bug in my 
edit decision list software that actually <laughs> caused the scenes to get cut out of order. <laughs> That's and awesome. I, I'm realizing way after, you know, I, I, I left Lightworks and I was now in, in LA and I, several jobs later, and uh, there, there uh, I was seeing a bug in my movie. Oh, that's amazing. And I can imagine how, how hard it would be to to try to piece together the plot of Pulp Fiction. It's not a standard movie where it's the same characters go through some sort of plot line. There's so many different vignettes. Uh, I thought you were going to say maybe The Abyss or something by uh, James Cameron, someone known for his technological breakthroughs. Uh, Quentin Tarantino, that's awesome. That's definitely, yeah, uh, in fact, definitely did not see that coming. Yeah, uh, I think um, the uh, what 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 are his other movies? The um, uh, there was one really gruesome, violent one about a a couple that go on a shooting rampage. That was around right about the same time. Natural born uh, killers. Natural born killers. Oh my word, that one was also some of the test material. And then um, Oliver Stone. He had a series of movies um, that was also, they were also cut on Lightworks um, all okay. around about that same time. Um, and the, the those scenes, when I see them now many years later, they, they transport me back to those late night um, software uh, developments where we're cranking, trying to fix bugs and add features that famous Hollywood filmmakers have been requesting and so okay here's here's the uh here's the feature that, that oliver stone requested uh here's the feature that uh tarantino's requested and so you know we we we, we knew these people almost the first, I, i've never met either either of them i think francis ford coppola came into our office once and i i saw him in the distance but i i i wasn't hobnobbing with him but their their, their feature requests um came to us and i was managing the software development at the time that that is that's probably the most product in LA thing that's ever been a feature request from Oliver Stone and Quentin Tarantino. I love it, Riza, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for for sharing your story. Uh, amazing, amazing stuff that you've been able to accomplish um, from the very get go and continue to do now. Excellent, Ethan. Always good to catch up, and uh, maybe maybe one day we'll we'll. Uh... We'll get a coffee. What's the LA thing to do? Let's go and get a, a chai lunch. You do lunch. You do lunch. You do lunch. Okay. We're gonna do lunch. Um and uh I'll I'll Uber because I'm I'm carless at the moment. <laughs> That's the least LA thing. Uh but thank the thank you again, Riza. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, PMALA and Yeruit, available at uruit.com. I want to thank you all for listening to us one more time, and uh, we'll catch you next time on Product in L.A. 